It would be a dumpster fire if Stephen A. Smith doesn't re-sign with ESPN. Because without Stephen A. Smith or Pat McAfee, for that matter, what does ESPN really have? I've seen a lot of headlines about how much Stephen A. is, is asking for. He wants to be the highest paid personality on ESPN, rightfully so, quite frankly. I mean, think about how much we talk about him on OutKick. Um, yeah, rightfully so. Stephen A. moves the needle. And, Chad, the report is he's been offered five years, $18 million a year. That puts him around, what, $90 million over the course of the contract. He um, was the highest paid ESPN personality five years ago whenever he signed. Now, that is certainly not the case now. Troy Aikman's making, I believe, $18.5 million on average per year with Monday Night Football. Pat McAfee. Um, getting around, what, $30 million for the in- entirety of that contract annually. And that's what they're pointing to here from Stephen A's side of things. WME is representing him. They're wanting $30 million, which is more or less what McAfee is asking for. Which he's alluded to wanting to be even sure. with McAfee. Sure. And the, the counter to that argument or that, that offer has been, well, this, this amount with McAfee also includes his show, which, I mean, there are semantics to that. They lease his show. Um, you could tell that just based on how he says what he wants to say and gets away with it and has the streaming hour and does some other things on his own YouTube page. Nonetheless, I think the belief is they're going to somehow come to terms around $20 million annually, that the counter's been 25 from Stephen A. Sizing. Stephen A. should continue to make that price rise. I would, because it doesn't sound like Barkley has any interest in ESPN. And without Pat McAfee, who are we talking about at that network? It's just him. And he knows it. That's it. Even Monica McNutt would have to admit that. <laughs> so with that in mind, keep going up, Stephen A. I'm on board with you here, man. I'm not one of those that's saying, oh, you know, look at the greed. Look, at he's just trying to get above the white man who's making the most right now. He is, no, 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 no. Uh, he's trying to get exactly what has come due to him because he moves the needle. Again, just read the headlines across any other outlet not named ESPN.com. It's Stephen A. said this. Can you believe who said this on first take? Stephen A. said this on his podcast and not on ESPN because they're a failing network. No. ESPN's going to have to pay him. <clears throat> especially when you consider that they're going to continue to have the, the, the NBA and they need to move the needle with not just outlandish takes, but some actual discussion and thought behind whatever they're saying when they crack the mic or turn the camera on. Stephen A. Smith gives you that, and they need it to be on, his pla- on, on their platform, not his own platform, or come to some agreement where they can share both. Because otherwise... This is not good news for ESPN if they're just offering 18 on average and he wants upwards of 25 to 30. I, I like it when any talent gets paid. Uh, that's always, you know, good, good for our business. So I, I got no problem with these guys trying to get as much as they can. But Hutton, let's just go down the checklist of ESPN personalities that deserve the bag based on okay. what they bring to the network currently. Won't take long. <laughs> Scott Van Pelt. <laughs> yes. Stephen A. Smith. Yes. Pat McAfee. Absolutely. And then I would say Joe Buck and Troy Aikman as a, as a package well, deal. Yeah, because of the brand of Monday Night Football. Right. right. As a package deal, those are names that bring, you know, Monday Night Football cachet uh, to a, a big-time sports property. That, that's it. Well, hang on. That's not me saying there are Kirk other... Street. Let, let's go Kirk Herbstreit. Street. Let's go to College Game Day. Yep. Uh, there, there are certain brands that fit... You think of the name and you think of ESPN as well as the sport that they're going to be discussing. So there's more than just five. There's more than just four or five. But and that, I'm not saying that on these a daily are just basis, the, these are not the only people who are good. On a daily basis, I, there's I, really two. I'm talking about if you want to go with who moves the needle, right? I think Reese Davis is really good. Okay. I, I think that Reese Davis is great for college game day. I think that they could live without Reese Davis and find another good host of that show also. You're right about Kirk Herbstreit. Tough to replace Kirk Herbstreit. Um, Nick Saban now becomes sort of that person, too. Sure. That is, if he's as good as we think, that's someone else that deserves the quote-unquote bag from ESPN. But st- specifically with Stephen A. Smith, I mean, yes, he should make as much as Pat McAfee. 
because you can't just hide behind, well, McAfee also does college game day. Well, Stephen A. Smith is being long. filmed walking through the parking garage of NBA Finals venues like he's Luka Doncic. That's how much he means to Disney, ABC, and ESPN. They're, they're filming him walk in like one of the players, which I thought was stupid as hell, by the way, and most everyone else did also. Uh, I'd be embarrassed if I were Stephen A. Smith being subjected to that, but he probably loved it. But the fact that he loves it and the fact that ESPN wants to do it and treat it like something serious shows you that he's worth it because he is going to move the needle. So if not Stephen A. Smith, then who? So I, well, I don't blame him one bit for wanting to make as much as McAfee. I'll say that if not Stephen A. Smith, then what? <laughs> then what is ESPN during the day? Oh, I have McAfee. Yeah, that's more money for McAfee. But possibly. you see what I'm saying? But like, what, what, what's, what's moving the needle if the, if the theory or if the evidence is pointing to it's a network that's failing anyway? You know? It's tough to find those personalities. You know, we, we, uh, we watched and heard Dan Dockich talk with Dan Patrick about this. And Dan Patrick yeah. said it was, it was difficult because they did not want us being famous when he was working with Keith Olbermann, that we were getting too popular, but almost more, too good at what they were doing yeah. to where people wanted them as the tag team duo on, on SportsCenter, and ESPN was uncomfortable with that. Well, now ESPN has created some superstars, but there are very few that are left. Those few that are left that move the needle and push profits and push eyeballs, they're, they're going to have to pay him. They're paying McAfee. They're going to have to pay Stephen A. Smith. They know that. And I think we just went through the checklist. Herb Street's a great addition to it of personalities at ESPN that you would immediately say, okay, they're worth it. Yeah. Whatever you're paying them, they're worth it. But it's not a long list of names. No. And that's not to say there's not well, other really good people at ESPN. And there's not many that Those are, are just the names that immediately pop to mind. That, that can transcend whatever sport you have them, you know, cornered into. You know, I, th I think of the NBA when I think of Stephen A. Smith, but it's not just the NBA because of first take. You know, you can send him to the big fight, the McGregor fight, the boxing match. You can send him on the road for a, a massive NFL game or college football, whatever it is. Like, he, he can fit into all of that. Uh... Same can be said for Herb Street crossing over between college football and the NFL and that lane. But as far as just the all-encompassing figureheads, it's two. It's Pat McAfee and Stephen A. Smith. And if I'm Pat McAfee, don't you want Stephen A. making more for the next time? You want to just continue to climb the ladder, don't you? I think you want one of two things here, McAfee. And I, I, I don't want to put words into his, uh, his mouth or thoughts into his brain or his heart. But I think you want one of two outcomes here. Either Stephen A. Smith makes more, giving you more leverage to ask for more than him in your next contract, or Stephen A. Smith bolts, and then you're left being the guy in the daytime at ESPN, which will probably lead to more money for you also, unless ESPN goes and overspends for someone else. Like Barkley and just gives them an astronomical yeah, amount of money. Then, but you, then you that, would, that was, would hurt the ability to pay you at some point, too. But there's but really not anybody that's about to open up get. a lot of money if, they, if Stephen A. Smith leaves, too. Yeah, well, yes. But, like, who do you go and grab? Barkley, that, other than him. That's it. That, that's established that can just step in and do it. That is it. You know? Or you go grab Bayless, you know, again. I, get, I don't know. I don't think Colin Cowherd's coming back. Don't know, don't know the contract status of any of them, but so they're not going to command I what Stephen A's there's, asking for. There's not the no-brainer that's, that's out there. The, the McAfee deal was a no-brainer for someone because what they built was so popular just by themselves on YouTube with that show. Yeah, and they had sold with, to FanDuel. They had sold already and made a lot of money off of it. They were doing some interesting things around uh, college football, pro wrestling. Uh, I mean, a lot of different avenues for McAfee and his crew. So that made a ton of sense. I can't automatically think of the next personality or show that makes sense if Stephen A. Smith weren't a part of ESPN. Maybe I'm missing someone, but I, I can't think of anyone. Uh, last night, regular season game. At uh, Rick Woodfield. And Reggie Jackson was there uh, on Fox uh, where uh, Rick Wood was, uh, hosted Alabama's first integrated sports team, uh, Birmingham Barons, in 1964, which was 17 years after Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball. Uh, and here is Reggie Jackson discussing his return and what was a bittersweet moment. Reggie, the, the baton has been passed for over a century here. We, we've been talking earlier about if it wasn't for the Willie Mays, the 
Jackie Robinson, the Reggie Jacksons, the three of us wouldn't have an opportunity to play. How emotional is it for you to come back to a play that you played with one of the greatest teams around? Alex, Alex, when people ask me a question like that, it's like coming back here is not easy. The racism that I played here, when I played here, the, the difficulty of going through different places where we traveled. Fortunately, I had a manager and I had players on the team that helped me get through it. But I wouldn't wish it on anybody. People said to me today, I spoke and they said, you think you're a better person. You think you, you, you won when you played here and conquered. I said, you know, I would never want to do it, want to do it again. I walked into restaurants and they would point at me and said, can't eat here. I would go to a hotel and they say, then can't stay here. We went to Charlie Finley's country club for a welcome home dinner and they pointed me out with the N-word. He can't come in here. Finley marched the whole team out. Finally, they let me in there. He said, we're going to go to the diner and eat hamburgers. We'll go where we're wanted. Fortunately, I had a manager, Johnny McNamara, that if I couldn't eat, if I couldn't, thank you, if I couldn't eat in the place, nobody would eat. We'd get food to travel. If I couldn't stay in a hotel, they'd drive to the next hotel and find a place where I could stay. Had it not been for Raleigh Fingers, Johnny McNamara, Dave Duncan, Joe and Sharon Rudy, I slept on their couch three, four nights a week for about a two, month and a half. Finally, they were threatened that they would burn the our apartment complex down unless I got out. I, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. The year I came here, Bull Connor was the sheriff the year before. And they took base, minor league baseball out of here because in 1963, the Klan murdered four black girls, children, in 11, 12, 14 years old, at a church here and never got indicted. It, it was, they were from the Klan. Life Magazine did a story on them it, it, like they were being honored. It, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. At the same time, had it not been for my white friends, had it not been for a white manager and Rudy Fingers and Duncan and Lee Myers, I would have never made it. I was too physically violent. I was ready to physically fight some. I'd have got killed here because I'd have beat someone's ass, and they'd have, you'd have saw me in an oak tree somewhere. Reggie, I, I, well, I, I can't even imagine. It's awful you had to go through that, but uh, you know, I appreciate you sharing the rawness and the honesty of it with our audience. I mean, really, it's. We love you, Reg. Yeah, thank You're you. Quick history lesson right that, there. That, that's a great man. history thank lesson. You. Reggie Jackson telling us all about it, preaching. Wow, that's unbelievable. The great Reggie Jackson, the Hall of Famer, joining us here, and we've got more to do. And we were yeah, and that, that puts it, I mean, that was, what, 60 years ago? Yeah. It was not, you know, you think of the Civil War in 1864. Uh, this is 60 years ago. That's why when I see these headlines of race war for Caitlin Clark and the WNBA, just play this clip. Yeah, I, you, you got it. And I, I was not alive during those times that Reggie was talking about. I, I would highly advise everyone watch the documentary Reggie that's on Prime Video, too. It's like an hour and a half. Uh, but it's really good. He gets into a lot of things like this that he's talking about in this interview. And it's very much a first-person account of his life and career throughout baseball, different obstacles because of racism, because of different issues. Uh, it kind of explains difficult relationships he had in the game and talks about that explosive physical anger that he had, uh, where he was fighting a lot of people and saying things that he shouldn't at times as well. Very self-reflective from Reggie, Reggie Jackson, one of the all-time greats. Uh, it, it's great to watch. I, I love watching that honesty and those stories for the reasons Hutton said that it really puts things in perspective that it's not that long ago. My dad just had his 80th birthday. When my dad was in the Navy, my dad was one of the, the Naval... Uh, officers, one of the, 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 the uh, people in the Navy that were looking for freedom riders all through Mississippi when they were murdered uh, by Klansmen, uh, by people in, in Mississippi. I mean, that, that's race war stuff. Right. And uh, my dad was one of the ones that had to scour the woods and swamps in Mississippi looking for dead bodies when they disappeared. That's in his lifetime. I mean, that's in his 20s 
early 20s this was happening. So it's not something that's so far away. You can't still talk to people that lived through it and understand what it was like in America at that point. So I think history lessons like that from people who lived it are still very important. We're losing our greatest generation of World War II veterans. There's not many left that can talk about it. So that, or that, that, want to. that living monument yeah. to that war, they're fading away. And now as everyone ages into elderly status that lived through the, the civil rights movement to, to this level, it's important to get those history lessons like that one. Chad, the NFL, uh, they are in the middle of that uh, court case. They've got the lawsuit going for antitrust with the NFL Sunday ticket on what was DirecTV, now YouTube. They also are in the middle of this collusion grievance over the fully guaranteed quarterback contracts that is uh, set to go to trial this summer. Now, they have arbitration going on. They have a, a mutually agreed upon uh, arbiter, mediator in this. But they're specifically looking at 2022-23. And the non-exclusive franchise tag that was placed on Lamar Jackson. And then that would have allowed, and it did allow, any other team to put a qualifying offer out there for Lamar Jackson to sign, for which the Baltimore Ravens could have matched or could decide to let him walk. And of course, there was no other team that decided that they were going to put a qualifying offer out there. So the collusion angle is being dissected from that one account and then being compared to what happened with Deshaun Watson. Get ready. Because both sides agreed to this person uh, being the, the overseer of said arguments. I'm intrigued to see how the, uh, the NFL, which by the way, we will not have like in-person accounts from the courtroom like we do from this uh, antitrust case where we know who's testified, who said what, we won't have a clue as to who's testifying and when or who's saying what about the, the collusion that could be going on. But without a doubt, this went down, um, especially after what happened with Haslam and the Cleveland Browns and the guaranteed money that Deshaun Watson received. I've always said, if you want this to stop, now my nose is itching. If you want this to stop, and I want this to stop, yeah. it's very the quarterback the just simply said, we're not playing. We're going to uh, band together and uh, screw you. You want the best playing the quarterback position because you need it because that's the game? Pay us, just like Deshaun got. They didn't do that. They signed. So ultimately, they agreed to the terms that were out there, and I think that benefits the, the NFL in this argument. I think the, the collusion is that all the other owners agree they don't want to do this. So I, the standard of proof, the burden of proof in something like collusion, when you're claiming it, I wonder how difficult it is to get, like, written, hey, they said this to each other, these four owners talked about it via text message, email, whatever. How, how to prove collusion, I think, is going to be the difficult part in this. Well, the, the agreement they absolutely that no, don't one, want to do this, that and they no other this. team would extend an offer, a qualifying offer to Lamar Jackson as a non-exclusive franchise tag recipient. Like, that, that's going to be one of the main But they would have examples. to find, I think, to, to prove collusion, they'd have to find – actual examples of them via text message, email, something where they're talking with each other saying, don't do it. Or some mass email went out or something like that. If not, or it's just all the owners doing what we know they want to do. And that's not give fully guaranteed contracts. Yeah. And I continue to see the quarterback sign these fully non-guaranteed, without fully uh, uh, yeah. not guaranteed contracts, I should say. Well, and, that, and that's, yeah. And they, they want to get paid while they can. Um, sure. But I, I've, they're still do, they, do they actually talk about it in forums where they could get caught talking about it? I don't know if they do. Or if it's just so understood well, that they don't even have to talk about it. We know that Jim Irsay talked about it with what Haslam did publicly. Yeah. So they do speak on it. The question is... That, could, that could be put into evidence. Yeah, no doubt. Chad, uh, Tom Brady is going to talk about the game. And he was on Colin Cowherd recently and said that he's going to do everything possible to make sure he's great at it. Today. When you watch the tapes, do you notice a difference with you? Yeah, I would say yes. And I also think there's still so much more room for improvement. And I just, it's 
almost like when I was a player, I never felt like I did things the right way. I'd, there were games where I'd go in afterward and think, God, I'm the worst quarterback in the NFL. Like, why would they even want me to play quarterback for this team? And I'm, and I'm sure I'm going to feel that way here at Fox where I finish a game and I go, God, I didn't even give them what they wanted. And it's, it's a very challenging thing in your own mind. I've asked a few people, like, how do you, how do you know that you did a good job? And I think for me, so much of this is going to come down to the preparation. And did I feel like I was prepared? Did I feel like our crew was prepared? Did I give them the best over the course of the week so that we could give ourselves the best opportunity to be successful for the fans? Because really the, the game is the show. We're there to add our take on it and in, in our, our analysis. But it's also, did we feel like we added to the broadcast and from my standpoint, I'm going to work as hard as I can in the process of it, as you talked about earlier, to make sure that I do deliver because I don't want to let anyone down. I don't want to let the people at Fox are down. And I certainly don't want to watch, let, let the great NFL fans down. There's Tom Brady. I, I don't think he's going to fail one bit at this. And I said, from the jump, I, I thought it was going to be excellent. I can't wait. Uh, I feel bad for Greg Olson, but can't wait for Brady to be behind the mic because he is going to study and work and prep and make sure that that broadcast is legit. The anticipation around him being on a, a television broadcast is going to be bigger than anyone who's ever done it. Uh, I, I feel very comfortable in saying that. Just to hear a color commentator for the first time in a game, when he has that, is it, uh, is it Browns? Uh, Cowboys? Browns Cowboys. Browns first Cowboys game. his first game. When he's, when he's calling that Browns Cowboys game, the anticipation is going to be through the roof. And that level of accountability where he's talking about, I don't want to let other people down. You can overthink those things a lot. I, I think about those things a lot. I probably at times too dependent on, I just don't want to let someone down or let people down and it wears on you. But when he's comparing it to his NFL career where he says, there are times I'm thinking, why would anyone want me to play quarterback for this team? Players and anyone around included. It's that level of commitment and self-reflection and thought that helped make Tom Brady who he is. And it's that level of commitment and thought that he's going to put into it of not wanting to disappoint anyone, but most importantly himself, that will guarantee that he's going to be good at this. Cam, that's the way I feel watching that. Cam Smith's pretty good at golf. Chad had a chance to catch up with him yesterday after the show. Uh, it took, he said it took him three hours and 40 minutes to play nine holes yesterday on, that, on the, on the Pro-Am. And he apologized for – he was going to join us towards the end of the show yesterday. Yeah. And he popped in. I didn't know they were only playing nine. Well, he was swapping out with somebody after nine. Okay. And uh, as he was swapping out, he was going to join us as he was going into the clubhouse. And he was, you know, a, a bit late, but again, not his fault. Um, talked about a number of things, which we'll play the full interview coming up later in today's show. But one thing that, I don't know, I've never really noticed or took notice of or tried to really get into until Liv was in our own backyard were the, the team names and the logos. I don't know if you did the same thing. Yeah. But I was studying those logos all day. He's got uh, the Rippers. And he's got the, the, the Aussies are well represented. And so I asked him about his logo because unless you ask the question, I wouldn't know what in the hell this is. The design behind the, like the, the story behind the logo at all? Yeah, I, I did it. What, so <laughs> tell me what I'm looking at. Uh, so I, I don't know if you can really see that. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so there's... Uh, on, on our Australian flag, we have the Southern Cross. So this is just basically a, a different version of the Southern Cross. Uh, this is the story we need to get out about these logos. Yes. Every logo has a story. Yeah, so the Southern Cross, uh, when you're in Australia, you look up at night, and this is the formation of uh, one of the stars. Okay. So it's, on our, it's on our flag. Um, yeah, and, and we've just got, kind of uh, made it the same, but also a little bit different, uh, tried to make it look... Look kind of fast and and look kind of fun and it looks cool. Um, the maroon uh, is is near and dear to my heart uh, because I'm a Queenslander, um, which is where I'm my state where I'm from. It's our it's our uh, state colours, um, so I needed to have the maroon on there and and the uh, and the Southern Cross for Australia. I see. I had I not asked that question, I would have no idea what that logo represented yeah, to you. This is our night sky, basically. I I'm in. Yeah, I'm in on this now. <laughs> I'm in on all these logos, honestly. The only thing that would have made that interview better and that answer better if you guys were chugging Foster's oil cans in front of you Jed, while doing that interview. Believe it or not, I, I asked him about Foster's. Did you? And we'll get his answer to Foster's That's, uh, and whether or not it is Australian for me. Making beer. note to watch that. <laughs> That's coming up a little bit later in the show.